Today we ask, what are the dangers of deep sea mining? You look at the risks and rewards of mining the seabed. Metals in their authorized zone may supply batteries for more than 200 million electric vehicles. Deep sea mining might produce close to 76% less carbon dioxide than its land-based counterpart. Nonetheless, noise pollution is a constraint on this process. In addition to noise pollution, studies indicate that deep sea mining will devastate habitats and marine life through sediment plumes, chemical pollution, and light pollution, negatively affecting the nearby area, migratory species, and important fisheries. It could get worse. Sadly, there are many more negative effects attributed to deep sea mining than scientists are letting on. In this video, we reveal the truth about deep sea mining. This revelation will leave you spellbound and bewildered about the impact of deep sea mining on our environment. Let's dive in. Black potato-shaped nodules are located at a depth of 4 kilometers beyond the light of our star. These nodules may hold the secret to an electric future. These curiously shaped bulbs have existed for millions of years, gradually increasing in size. These formations have been recognized for over 150 years. In fact, the HNS Challenger retrieved samples from the enigmatic Midnight Zone Abyss in 1873, dropping kilometer-long hemp ropes with a collection device attached and accidentally bringing one of these nodules to the surface. Each of these lumps contains metals that can aid in resolving one of the largest supply chain concerns of the contemporary era, battery manufacturing. Manganese, cobalt, nickel, and copper-containing minerals are dispersed across the enormous seafloor. It is projected that a plot of land somewhat larger than Ireland could generate over 54 million tons of metals worth over $20 billion. Since their discovery, they have served as nothing more than intriguing elements of the seafloor. Given that the precious metal they contain can be extracted on land, there is no incentive to mine the nodules for profit. Nonetheless, hundreds of organizations are searching for novel approaches to expose these nodules due to escalating supply chain issues and intensifying rivalry in the electric vehicle sector. We have a frighteningly limited understanding of the deep sea floor. Beyond 999 meters deep, there is no longer any light and thus no photosynthesis. The only possible light source is the faint glow of bioluminescence. Without sunlight, food becomes exceedingly rare and animals must rely on what is known as marine snow, which consists of biological detritus that falls from shallower seas. These severe conditions have led to the evolution of some of the most distinctive species in the animal kingdom. At more than 3,999 meters, you might encounter a semi-translucent Dumbo octopus, a gulper eel with a vastly expanded gullet, or a viperfish with terrible lifeless eyes and amazingly keen fangs. Still deeper, scavengers and detrivores scour the ocean floor for any crumb of food they may find. This type of animal has been discovered as deep as 11,000 meters in the ocean's deepest regions. ROVs and a few manned expeditions are beginning to explore the ocean's depths, but it is not easy. Only four crewed expeditions have ever reached the Mariana Trench's depths. The deep sea is one of the few ecosystems on Earth entirely unspoiled by humans. This raises significant concerns over the impact of any mining operation on the weird and wondrous species that inhabit these metal-rich rocks. Early seafloor observations in the 1960s and 1970s indicated that nodules are concentrated in particular locations. Environmental variables largely determine their locations. Growth needs high levels of oxygenation and a metal supply in the seafloor or ocean. Similar to how the iron in steel reacts with oxygen and water to generate a rust layer, nodules form in oxidized metal layers. Free-flowing iron and manganese ions dissolved in water interact with oxygen from above to produce layers. A piece of debris must sink into the oxygen-rich environment of the deep sea floor for a nodule to form. These form nodules on the seafloor surface. From below, Concentration gradients push up the metals through the porous sediment. Once they reach oxygen-rich environments, they react and form nodules 10 to 15 centimeters below the surface. Depending on their depth, various metal concentrations will be present. While manganese and iron make up the majority of the metals in the nodules, copper is also present. The surface nodules are more exposed to cobalt, whereas the deeper nodules accumulate more lithium and nickel. These strata form at an astoundingly slow rate of 1 to 10 millimeters per million years. In the time it took for our ancestors to expand from Africa and take control of the world, these nodules developed only 0.017 to 0.081 millimeters. 
approximately the width of a human hair. Based on these environmental factors, scientists can anticipate where these nodules will appear, which we have confirmed by observing them in high quantities in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. The majority of these zones are international waters. In 1994, the UN established the International Seab Authority. To date, no licenses for mining activities have been issued. However, permission has been granted for 19 exploration missions of these polymetallic nodules. The Clarion Clipperton Zone, a region just off the coast of Mexico, is home to 16 bases. Each of these missions covers around 75,000 square kilometers or approximately 0.16% of the CCZ. The potential yield of a mine site of this size is estimated to be approximately 1.5 million tons of wet nodules per year. The average battery for an electric vehicle has 35 kilograms of nickel, 20 kilograms of manganese, and 14 kilograms of cobalt. A mine of this size would produce sufficient nickel for 400,000 car batteries, sufficient manganese for 18 million, and sufficient cobalt for 100,000 vehicles yearly. There is no denying the value of these resources, yet, we have never collected solid minerals at this scale from the seafloor. This would necessitate new technology, and not surprisingly, many are borrowed from the oil and gas business, which is well versed in extracting value from the deep water. Companies must first choose a place where the concentration of these nodules is high enough to make extraction profitable. First, autonomous submarines are dispatched to the area, using sound pulses to map and scan the seafloor. The resolution of these scanners is insufficient to directly detect individual nodules, typically less than 10 centimeters in diameter. Still, they may estimate the density of the nodules on the seafloor before dispatching another expedition to collect physical samples. Extraction. Now comes the challenging part. There have been numerous proposed solutions, and there are numerous obstacles to overcome. Several trials were done in the 1970s and 1980s. The knowledge collected from these trials led to the same mining method ideas. A self-propelled rover would be lowered to the seafloor using a stiff riser and a flexible conduit connected to a surface ship. These risers are well-developed technologies created by the oil and gas sector. Once the collecting rover has landed on the ocean floor, it can be remotely maneuvered from above. Instead of calming over the soil, most rovers utilize a water jet to dislodge the nodules and drive them into the collector similar to a potato harvester. After dislodging the nodules, the collectors transport the sludge and nodules through a separator. The liquid is discharged behind the collector, generating a dust cloud to trail after the rover. The remaining slurry with debris and nodules is presently being pumped. From here on, the situation becomes a little more challenging. This enormous distance demands a great bit of energy to raise stuff. However, attaching a rope to raise materials is difficult to scale. Transporting solid things is significantly more difficult than pumping liquid oil. Two primary strategies are now proposed for bringing the nodules to the surface. One method is to pump pressurized air into the pipe, which produces the appropriate pressure beneath the raw material to raise it to the surface. However, the energy efficiency of this technology is just about 15%. The second alternative is to place submersible centrifugal pumps at intervals along the stiff rise. This is the favored method. Once the nodules reach the surface, they are sorted from the remaining sludge. They are then dehydrated before being transported to the mainland. However, the remaining undesired sludge must be pumped down and ejected into the water column. Actually, this slurry is one of the key environmental hazards associated with deep-sea mining. It cannot be released at the top of the water column, where it could harm numerous levels of the ocean ecosystem. It would be detrimental to plankton and other photosynthetic creatures to pump sun-blocking silt above these levels. Even if the waste product plumes have little effect, the mining operations can potentially wipe out unstudied species. The sea sponges utilize the nodules as anchors. Deep-water octopuses use them to lay and safeguard their eggs. And because the formation of these nodules takes millions of years, any surviving members of the species that depend on them would be displaced. There you have it, guys, the truth about deep sea mining. What do you think? Do you think the advantage of this process outweighs the negative impacts? Let us in on your thoughts and opinions in the comment section. If this video is insightful, please go on and like this video. Remember to subscribe to our channel and click the bell button for more updates.